Hey everyone, so I'm going to do an audio recording of books 11 and 12 of Jack Kerouac's autobiography called Vanity of Deleuze, The Adventurous Education of a Young Man. This audio recording covers specifically the parts of books 11 and 12 that mention Lucian Carr and discuss the David Kammerer murder. The entire book is through the first person point of view of the author and narrator, Jack Kerouac. This book is a Romanoclef where the names are changed of the various members, um, but not only are the names changed, um, the events, the autobiographical events are also changed and tweaked slightly. For example, they talk about here how Claude, um, who is actually Lucian, is from New Orleans, but in reality he was from St. Louis, Missouri. So they add the New Orleans thing kind of to like change the name, preserve some anonymity, add flavor, whatever. So with the exception of some of the events that are kind of cross-referenced in the other Beats autobiographies, um, because this is a semi-autobiography, like a lot of their works, it's hard to know which events did happen versus which events did not happen versus which events happened but were changed slightly. Um, just a disclaimer, I am not actually sure how to pronounce Deleuze. I don't know if it's Deleuze or Deleuze. I wasn't able to actually find a straight answer online, so if anybody knows, you are welcome to correct me. Um, and just another disclaimer, um, I actually don't know how to pronounce a lot of the words in this book, including a lot of the um, proper nouns and a lot of the French terms and phrases, and also just a lot of vocabulary that was more popular in the 40s. Um, just to warn you, this book is very hard to do an audio recording of because there are so many run-on sentences and um, there oftentimes isn't punctuation, like it's just a lot of commas that go on and on and on. So I will do my best. Um, there's probably a reason there isn't an audiobook on this. In this book, Lucian Carr's name is changed to Claude Mabry. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but it's Claude. And David Kammerer's name is changed to Franz Mueller. William S. Burroughs' name is changed to Will Hubbard. Edie Parker, who was Jack Kerouac's girlfriend at the time, her name is changed to Johnny, um, but it's spelled with an I-E at the end. Um, and yeah, so just remember those things. Lucian is Claude, David is um, Franz, and you should be good. We're actually going to start several chapters into book 11, and we'll start with chapter 8. Also, I'm doing a very jank audio recording. I'm just screen recording with my Mac with the book cover pulled up, and then I'm reading from the actual paperback itself, so you will hear me turning pages. And after each chapter, I may do a very short one or two sentence blurb uh, on the real life events. Also, because of all the run-ons and weird punctuation, um, it can be a little hard to listen to in audiobook form, so just do your best to keep up. Book 11, Chapter 8. There was this kid from New Orleans called Claude de Mabry, remember Claude is Lucian, who was born in England of a French viscount now in the consular service and of an English mother, and who now lived with his grandmother in a Louisiana estate whenever he was there, which was seldom. Blonde, 18, of fantastic male beauty like a blonde Tyrone power with slanted green eyes and the same look, voice, words, and build. I mean by words he expressed his words with the same forcefulness. A little more like Alan Ladd, actually. Actually, like Oscar Wilde's model male heroes, I suppose. But anyway, he showed up on the Columbia campus at this time, followed by a tall man of six foot three, with a huge flowing red beard who looked like Swinburne. I forgot to mention that during the winter of 1943 and 1944, I had worked at odd jobs for extra money, including, of all things, a job as a switchboard operator in the little local campus hotels, then later as a script synopsizer for Columbia Pictures on 7th Avenue downtown. So on my return trip from New Orleans, I was planning to get one of those jobs back while waiting for a ship. It so happened that this Claude got a room in Dalton Hall, small campus hotel. So did Swinburne. I knew the management there, and that was to be the focal point of most of these events. Well, turns out Claude arrives on the campus one warm afternoon for the second semester as a freshman at Columbia, and immediately runs into the library so he can play some Brahms records free in the listening booth. Swinburne's right behind him, but Angel Boy tells him to wait outside so he can listen to the music undisturbed with his earphones and think. Very intelligent kid of an order you'll see later. But... Point is, the professor of French classics at Columbia University at this time, Ronald Mugwump, I guess he was, 
a little fud of some kind I never saw or cared to look at, ran into the booth where Claude was and said something like, Where did you come from, you marvelous boy? You can see what was happening to this kid. And the scene. Because talk about your Foley's Bergere late 1890s fin de siècle dramas. Don't know what, how to pronounce this. This was the yellow pages of not only Tristan de Peradventure, whoever he was or will be, but the very yellow decadence of Beardsley, Dowson, Alastair Crowley, and the rest. I knew nothing of this at the time. It just turned out that my Johnny's apartment, remember Johnny is Edie, his girlfriend, Jack Kerouac's girlfriend, became the focal point of meetings for the wild outre gang of Columbia campus. First, she tells me there's this wild new young kid hanging around the West End bar called Claude, who is blonde and beautiful and strong and intelligent, and comes over to her place to take showers, but doesn't try to make her. Strangely, I believe her, and it turns out it's true. He's just chased so much, he has to hide somewhere. And being a Southern scion, or scion, of rich family as she is, and needing the hearty companionship of a good gal protector, he comes there. He finally starts bringing around his girl, the rich girl from Westport, Cecily. Um, so Cecily is the name that they used for Celine, who was Lucian Carr's girlfriend at the time. Finally, I first see him in the West End bar after waking up from my long nap. There he is. There's that marvelous Claude. Looks to me like a mischievous little prick, I said to Johnny, and I still think so. But he was okay. He wanted to ship out again. He had been a seaman out of New Orleans, maybe ship out with me. He was no fairy, and he was strong and wiry, and that first night we got really drunk, and I don't know whether it was that first night or not, it was, when he told me to get into an empty barrel and then proceeded to roll the barrel down the sidewalks of Upper Broadway. A few nights later, I do remember we sat in puddles of rain together in a crashing downpour and poured black ink over our hair, yelling folk songs and all kind of songs. I got to like him more and more. His quote-unquote Swinburne had been a Boy Scout master in Texas name of Franz Mueller, who first saw Claude when he joined the Boy Scouts innocently, wanted to go out in the woods and have fun with camps and scout knives and something to do. 14. The Scoutmaster fell in love with the Boy Scout, as usual. Now, I'm not a queer, and neither is Claude, but I've got to expand this queer tale. Franz, not a bad guy in himself, by the way, had first spent several years in Paris in about 1936 or so, and met a young 14-year-old French boy who looked exactly like Claude had fallen in love with him, tried to make him or corrupt him, or whatever the French or Greeks say, and was deported from France outright after some kind of investigation. Coming back to America and getting a job as a scoutmaster on weekends, while during the week an instructor in a Louisiana college, who does he see but the same kid? Only not French, but Anjou French aristocrat boy? He goes crazy. Claude is sent by his rich grandmother to prep school at Andover School right outside Lowell, Massachusetts. Is followed by red-bearded Swinburne. They throw big parties. Claude is ejected from Andover and doomed forever from going to Yale. He then tries another school. Franz follows him. It isn't that Claude wants Franz to follow him or that he wants to turn him away. It's just a lot of fun. Like one night in Bangor, Maine, Claude gets aboard the Whitlaw Yatch with Kenny Whitlaw, acquaintances of Johnny's, and they, 15, simply pull the plug out and sink the yatch and swim ashore. Pranks and stuff like that. A wild kid. A guy in New Orleans lends him his car, and Claude, 15, no license, nothing, wrecks it utterly on Basin Street. What's amazing about him is his absolute physical male and spiritual, too, beauty. Slant-eyed, green eyes, complete intelligence, language pouring out of him, Shakespeare reborn almost, golden hair with a halo around it. Old queens, when they saw him in Greenwich Village bars, wrote odes to him, starting with, Oh, fair-haired Grecian lad. Naturally, all the girls went for him, too. And even this old, dreamy, hard-hearted seaman and footballer, Jack, meaning himself, got to like him and drop tears over him. I remember meeting a fella for, from Virginia Gentry who once told me all them New Orleans boys had tragedy written in their hearts. Even Negroes from New Orleans ain't got too much luck, like Jelly Roll Morton's luck shows invents jazz and dies broke, or poor white boys like Big Slim. But what better luck is there than Louis Armstrong's? Anyway, the old classical professor runs in there and wants to know all about Claude, who's trying to listen to Brahms. Franz has to run in and rescue him by some hook or crook. Claude meets Johnny and finds that he can literally, that means really, hide out in her pad. 
And when I'm back with my black leather jacket from New Orleans, it makes no difference. He's been sleeping on the couch all the time anyway with Cecily. So begins our kind of apartment club. He looks at me and says, you're trying to write all the time, but every time I see you, you can't think of what to write. You look constipated. I give him the side look. He comes in through the roof, that is, from the roof down the fire escape in the rainy night with gunshots and shouts below. What's that? Some kind of terror, a fight with the bar, cops chasing, I ran over fences. You know, I can't hurt anybody. I'm too small. Now I'll sleep. Then I'll take a shower. Trouble with you, Deleuze, is... You're a hard-hearted, mean old, tight-fisted shit-ass, no-good Canuck who should have had his ass froze in the hearts of Manitoba where you and your bad blood belong, you Indian no-good bully. I'm no bully. Well, bully for you, give me a drink. I saw he was trying to cow me with his language as he wasn't about to start with anything else in those days. But when I saw he was seeing flaws in me, I should have seen myself. But when I saw he was just a mischievous little prick. So... Books everywhere. He's actually attending classes at Columbia. When he hears my stories about Piccadilly in London, he orders me more or less to write his composition paper for English composition, which I do, a story about some of the adventures there, and he gets an A, the rat. He says, My grandfather invented the steamer trunk, and I suppose your grandfather put potatoes in him. Yep. But he looks at me sideways because he can see what's behind all of that, going back beyond the potatoes in Canada to, yes, Scotland and Ireland and Cornwall and Wales and Isle of Man and Brittany. Celts can spot each other. Pronounce that. Okay. So basically a few sentences on that. Um, I think Allen Ginsberg also described him as this, would also talk about how gay men would write him sonnets that said stuff like, you know, oh, raven-haired Grecian lad or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, of course, Lucian was not from New Orleans. He was actually from St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, yeah, when they refer to Swinburne, they are also referring to David Kammerer. And it's true that uh, David Kammerer was uh, Lucian's scoutmaster when he was just 12 or 14 when they met. And then Edie Parker, who was Jack Kerouac's uh, girlfriend at the time, as we said, uh, was actually the one that introduced Lucian to him. And according to her biography, she actually met Lucian in her art class and said that, you know, all the girls were staring at him and whatnot. Yeah, so a lot of stuff in here about, <laughs> about Lucian's beauty. Okay, chapter nine. Also, as he's interested in symbolistic art, surrealism not so much, but say, Modigliani, the French Impressionists, all that darkness of my night sea life seems to disappear and in the spring sunshine, it seems that colors are being splashed over my soul. Now that sounds like Swinburne. Anyway, one afternoon, he and Johnny are off to study nude models with George Grosses, and they asked me to try it one afternoon. I went there and sat there as all the kids sketched and George Gross talked, and there she was, a naked brunette looking me right in the eye, and I had to leave and say to Claude at the door, What do you think I am? What's that, a voyeur old boy? And so they're out doing that and I've taken a shower and the door of Johnny's apartment knocks and I open it and there's a tall thin fellow in a seersucker jacket with Fran Swinburne behind him. I say, what? Swinburne already talked to me in the bar with Claude says, this is the Will Hubbard they were telling you about from out west? Well, he spent a lot of time in New Orleans too. In other words, old friend of mine and Claude's. Just wants to ask you about how to ship out in the merchant marine. Not in the service. Oh no, says Will, looking around with a toothpick in his mouth and removing it to give me the once over. Just 4F. Fnunk. Fnunk is where he blows out of his nose a kind of sinus condition and also English Lord expression as his name is very old. Um, okay, so um, William S. Burroughs, who they refer to as Will Hubbard here, um, did actually spend a lot of time in New Orleans. Chapter 10. Someday, in fact, I'll write a book about Will, just by himself, so ever onward the Faustian soul, so especially about Wilson Holmes Hubbard, I don't have to wait till he dies to complete its story. He above all is best left marching on with that aggressive swing of his arms through the medinas of the world. Well, a long story, wait. But in this case, he's come to see me about Claude, but saying it's just about the merchant marine. But what was your last job, I ask, bartender in New York? Before that? exterminator in Chicago, of bedbugs, that is. Just came to see ya, he says, to find out about how to get papers to ship out. 
But when I had heard about Will Hubbard, I pictured a stocky, dark-haired person of peculiar intensity because of the reports about him, the peculiar directness of his actions. But here he had come walking into my pad, tall and bespectacled and thin in a seersucker suit, as though he's just returned from a compound in equatorial Africa where he sat at dusk with a martini discussing the peculiarities. Tall, six foot one, strange, inscrutable because ordinary looking, scrutable. Like a shy bank clerk with a patrician, thin lipped, cold blue lipped face. Blue eyes saying nothing behind steel rims and glass. Sandy hair, a little wispy, a little of the wistful German Nazi youth as his soft hair fluffles in the breeze. So unobtrusive as he sat on the hassock in the middle of Johnny's living room and asking me dull questions about how to get sea papers. Now there's my first secret intuitive vision about Will, that he had come to see me not because I was a principal character now in the general drama of that summer, but because I was a seaman and thus seaman type to whom one asked about shipping out as a preliminary means of digging the character of said seaman type. He didn't come to me expecting a jungle of organic depths, or a jumble of souls, which begot on every level I was, as you can see, dear wifey and dear reader. He pictured a merchant seaman who would belong in the merchant seaman category and show blue eyes beyond that, and a few choice involuntary remarks, and execute a few original acts, and go away into endless space a flat, plained merchant seaman. And, being queer, as he was, but didn't admit it in those days, and never bothered me, he expected a little more on the same general level of shallowness. Thus, on that fateful afternoon in July of 1944 in New York City, as he sat on the hassock questioning me about sea papers, Fran smiling behind him, and I, and as I, fresh from the shower, sat in the easy chair in just my pants answering, began a relationship which, if he thought it was to remain a flat plane of interesting blue-eyed, dark-haired, good-looking seaman who knows Claude, wasn't destined to remain so a point of pride with me in that I've worked harder at this legend business than they have. Okay, joke. Though on that afternoon, he had no reason to surmise anything otherwise than shop talk from your aunt to mine. Yes, you've got to go now and get your Coast Guard pass first, down near the battery. Chapter 11 the fascination of Hubbard at first was based on the fact that he was a key member of this here New Orleans school, and thus this was nothing more than this handful of rich, sharp spirits from that town led by Claude, their, fa their falling star Lucifer angel boy demon genius, and Franz, the champagne cynical hero, and Will as observer waited with more irony than the lot of them, and others like Will's caustic charming buddy Kyle's Elgins, who with him at Harvard had collaborated on an ode to Order, which showed the Titanic sinking in the ship's captain, Franz, shooting a woman in a kimono to put on her said kimono and get on a lifeboat with the women and children, and when heroic sprayy men shout, Madame, will you take this 14-year-old boy on your lap? Claude. Captain Franz smirks, Why, of course. And meanwhile, Kyle's paranoid uncle, who lisps in hacking away at the gunwales with the Peruvian machete as reaching hands, rise from the waters, You bunch of bathheads! and a Negro orchestra is playing the Star-Spangled Banner on the sinking ship. A story they wrote together at Harvard, which, when I first saw it, gave me to realize that this here New Orleans clique was the most evil and intelligent bunch of bastards and shits in America, but had to admire in my admiring youth. Okay, that whole thing was one sentence. Sorry about that. Their style was dry, new to me. Mine had been the misty, nebulous New England idealist style, though, as I say. My saving grace in their eyes, Will's, Claude's especially, was the materialistic, canuck, taciturn, cold skepticism all the picked-up idealism in the world of books couldn't hide. Deleuze or Dulyuaz is a ship posing as an angel. Deleuze is very funny. Kyle's I didn't get to meet till years later. Doesn't matter here. But that Virginia gentryman did say, Clancy by name, everybody who comes from New Orleans in that group is marked with tragedy, which I found to be true. Chapter 12. The second time I saw Will, he was sitting around talking with Claude and Franz in his apartment in the village with that terrible intelligence and style of theirs. Claude chewing his beer glass and spitting out slivers, Franz following suit with, I suppose, store-bought teeth, and Hubbard long and lean in his summer seersucker suit emerging from the kitchen with a plate of razor blades and light bulbs says, I've something real nice in the way of delicacies my mother sent me this week. Hmph, hmph, hmph when he laughs with compressed lips, hugging his belly. 
I sit there with peasant frown, getting my first glimpse of the real devil, the three of them together. But I could see that Hubbard vaguely admired me. But what was this with me with a thousand things to do? But I bite my lips when I hear the word marvel, and I shudder with excitement when I hear Will say marvelous, because when he says it, it really is bound to be truly marvelous. I just saw a marvelous scene in the movie this afternoon, with his face all flushed, exalted, rosy, fresh from wind or rain where he walked, his glasses a little wet or smoky from the heat of his enthused eyeballs. This character in this awful beat movie about sex downtown, you see him with a great horse serum injector giving himself a big bang of dope, and then he rushes up, grabs this blonde in his arms, and lifts her up and goes rushing off into the dark field going, yip, yip, yippee! But I have to ask a thousand questions to know why Will is so glad. A dark field? Well, it's one of those dreary movies, real old and full of snaps on the screen. You can hear the rolls clank and blank up in the projection booth, so it's some kind of evening or dusk or something. A great endless horizon, you see him growing smaller and smaller as he rushes off with his girl. Yip, 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 yip. Finally, you just don't hear him anymore. He's gone away across the, that field, asks I, looking for mines and touchdowns and Galsworthy and the Book of Job. And I'm amazed by Will's way of saying, yip, 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 which he does with a cracky falsetto voice and never can say without bending over to hold his belly and compress his lips and go, <coughs> the high suppressed surprise, thoroughly gleeful laugh he has, or at least laughy. One afternoon, probably, when he'd arrived from Harvard for the summer, 1935 or so, with Kyle's downtown, kicked a few hours around with a sex movie in a cheap joint around Canal Street. These two great American sophisticates, you might say, sitting well up front, expensively dressed as always, like Laub and Leopold, in a half-empty movie full of bums and early 30s tea heads from the gutters of New Orleans, laughing in that way of theirs, actually Kyle's laugh, which Will had imitated since their childhood together, and finally the great scene where the mad dope addict picks up the monstrous syringe and gives him a big smack of H and grabs the girl who is some dumb moveless zombie of the story and walks hands at her sides. He, wild-haired and screaming with rain in the plip-plip of the ruined old film, rushes off, her legs and hair dangling like Fay Ray in the arms of King Kong, across that mysterious, dark, endless, Faustian horizon of Will's vision, happy like an Australian jackrabbit his feet and heels flashing snow. Yip, yip, yippee! Till, as Will says, his yips get dimmer and dimmer as distance diminishes his eager, all-fructified final goal joy. For that would be greater than that, Will thinks, than to have your arms full of joy and a good shot in you, and off you run into eternal gloom and flip all you want in infinity. That vision he must have had of that movie, that day in that manse of his seat. Legs crossed demurely, and so I picture him and Kyle sprawled then in laughter, broken up on the floor, in tweed coats or something, unwrist watchable, 1935, laughing, ha, 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 and even repeating, yip, yip, yippee, after that scene has long passed, but they can't forget it, a classic even greater than the Titanic short story. Then it is I see Will Hubbard that night after dinner at home in New Orleans with in-laws and walking under the trees and lawn lights of suburbia, going, probably, to see some clever friend, or even Claude or Franz. I just saw a marvelous scene in a movie today, God, yip, yip, yippee! Here, I say, and what did the guy look like? Wild, bushy hair. And he said, yip, yip, yippee, as he rushed off? With a girl in his arms. Across a dark field? Some kind of field. What was this field? My God, we're getting literary yet. Don't bother me with such idiotic questions. A field, he says, field with an angry or impatient shrieking choke. Like it's a peeled, calming down. A field, for God's sakes, you see him rushing off into the dark horizon. Yip, yip, yippee, I say, hoping Will will say it again. Yip, yip, yippee, he says, just for me. And so this is Will, though at first I really paid less attention to him than he did to me, which is a strange thing to reconsider because he always says, Jack, you're really very funny. But in those days, this truly tender and curious soul looked on me, after that flat semen phase, as some kind of intensity truth guy, with pride, owing to that scene one night the later week when we were all sitting on a park bench on Amsterdam Avenue, hot July night, Will, Franz, Claude, his girl Cecily, me, Johnny, and Will says to me, well, why don't you wear a merchant seaman uniform, man, like you said you wore in London for your visit there? 
and get a lot of soft entries into things. It's wartime, isn't it? And here you go around in a t-shirt and chino pints or paints or pants, and nobody knows you're a serviceman proud, should we say? And I answered, It's a finkish thing to do, which he remembered and apparently took to be a great proud statement coming straight from the saloon's mouth, as he, timid at the time, middle-class kid with rich parents, had always yearned to get away from his family's dull suburban life in Chicago, into the real rich America of saloons, and George Raft and Runyon characters, virile, sad, factual America of his dreams, though he took my statement as an opportunity to say in reply, It's a finkish world. Harbinger on the day when we'd become fast friends, and he'd hand me the full two-volume edition of Spangler's Decline of the West, and say, Eee, defy your mind, my boy, with the grand actuality of fact, when he would become my great teacher in the night. But in those early days, and at this about our third meeting, hearing me say, it's a finkish thing to do, which for me was just an ordinary statement at the time based on the way Seaman and my wife and I looked proudly and defiantly on the world of unlike us finks, a disgusting thing in itself granted, but that's what it was. Hearing me say that, Will apparently marveled secretly, whether he remembers it not now or not, and with timid and tender curiosity on top of that, his pale eyes behind the spectacles looking mildly startled. I think it was about then he rather vaguely began to admire me, either for virile independent thinking or rough trade, whatever they think, or charm or maybe broody melancholy philosophic Celtic unexpected depth, or simple ragged shiny frankness, or hank of hair, or reluctance in the revelation of interesting despair. But he remembered it well, we discussed it years later in Africa, And it was years later that I marveled over that, wishing we would turn time back and I could amaze him again with such unconscious simplicity, as our forefathers gradually unfolded and he began to realize I was really one, one of Britain blood, and especially, after all, one kind of a funny, imbecilic saint. With what maternal care he brooded over my way of saying it, looking away, down, frowning, it's a finkish thing to do, in that now, to me, New Orleans way of Claude's, snively, learned, pronouncing the consonants with force and the vowels with that slight you or eow you also hear spoken in that curious dialect they speak in Washington, D.C. I am trying to describe completely indescribable materials. But you say do or do you, and you say F as though it was being spat from your lazy lips. So Will sits by me on the bench in that irrecoverable night with mild amazement going, hmm, hmm, hmm. And it's a finkish world, and he's instructing me seriously, looking with blank and blink-interested eyes for the first time into mine. And only because he knew little about me then, amazed, as familiarity breeds contempt, and bread on the waters, there's a lot of fish after it. Where is he tonight? Where am I? Where are you? Okay, sorry, those last two chapters were a little more poetry than, um, than just, like, I guess... Uh, like novel prose. Um, So I kind of struggled with that a little bit. Um, I'll I'll also try to read a little bit slower because that was kind of fast. Chapter 13. Oh, Will Hubbard in the night. A great writer today he is. He is a shadow hovering over Western literature, and no great writer ever lived without that soft and tender curiosity, verging on maternal care about what others think and say. No great writer ever packed off from this scene on earth without amazement like the amazement he felt because I was myself. Tall, strange, old bull in his gray seersucker suit sitting around with us on a hot summer night in old lost New York of 1944, the grit in the sidewalk shining the same sad way in tween lights as I would see it years later when I would travel across oceans to see him, and just that same sad hopeless grit and my mouth like grit and myself trying to explain it to him. Will, why get excited about anything? The grit is the same everywhere. The grit is the same everywhere? What on earth are you talking about, Jack? I really thought you're awfully funny. (laughs) Holding his belly to laugh. Whoever heard of such a thing? I mean, I saw the grit where we sat years ago. To me, it's a symbol of your life. My life? My dear fellow, my life is perfectly free of grit, dearie. Let us relegate this subject to the I don't want to hear about it department and order another drink. Really. 
It blows in dreary winds outside the bars where you believe and believingly bend your head with the gray light to explain something to someone. And it blows to the endless dusts of atomic space. My god, I'm not going to buy you another drink if you get literary. Um, okay, so... Yeah, as we know, Willie, Will Hubbard is William S. Burroughs. He also was from St. Louis, and he was famous for his novels later on, um, including Naked Lunch, probably the most famous, um, which kind of had a bit of a cut-and-paste type style. Chapter 14. At this time, I'm writing about he was a bartender down on 6th Avenue, Avenue of the Americas, yet. Okay. How my head used to marvel in those days, tug at my heartstrings, break almost when I thought over what he meant, when he said where he worked. There were tables with chairs where you could sit and look at the sidewalk if you wanted to. The utter dismalness of poor Will. I pick on him in vengeance about my own present emptiness, so don't get worried. That harlequin hopelessness cognizing to this, so that it seems as if my whole life I spend facing one way, seeing endless interesting panoramas, and he, Will, by God, has been placed on just such a chair, to sigh, facing the other way, where nothing happens, his long gray face hopeless. With a mince, a little up look of his eyes playfully to a hoped-for watcher sympathetic to his plights, he sits, long-legged at the chair, looking at the empty sidewalk where there's nothing to look at, by which I'd say that bloody planet he comes from must have been destitute of life. I'm an agent from another planet, he said. He has, in fact, a destitute rock-like lifelessness. It's the reason why he kept pouncing on the subject, blab, blub, you young men should go out and experience life instead of sitting in rooms in your blue jeans, wondering when the rain'll come again. Why, when I was your age? He was nine years older than me, but I never noticed it. The central vision of Will, really, is we're sitting in a yard in two chairs, later in Morocco, and I'm reading him a letter I just wrote to a lady, wishing his opinion in whether I expressed myself politely, fitly, or fitly, politely, one, reading... Discriminating readers would be interested in reading what happened so they could form in their mind an idea of Buddhism in America on the practical level. How could it be any better than that, master? jokes Will, quite pleased that he doesn't have to vouchsafe an opinion. So then we just sit and say nothing. I get frowning a little, wondering what's with the master, but suddenly we're just sitting there peacefully, not bothering each other at all. As usual, simply blue-eyed Will. In fact, both of us listening to sounds of the afternoon, or even of Friday afternoon, in the universe. The soundless hum of inside silence, which he claims comes from trees. But I've been out there in that treeless desert in the night and heard it. But we're happy. And suddenly Will says, Oh God, I have to go to the laundry tomorrow. And suddenly he laughs because he realizes he just sounded like a whiny old lady sitting on the porch in Orlando, Florida. And so he says, My God, I sound like a dreary old Coween. Book 12, Chapter 1. Anyway, meanwhile, there's this fantastic Claude rushing across the campus, followed by at least 12 eager students, among them Erwin Garden, Lombard Krepnix, Joe Amsterdam, I think Arnie Jewell, all famous writers today. He's hurling back epigrammatical epithets at them and jumping over bushes to get away from them. And way back in the ivied corners of the quadrangle, you might see poor Franz Mueller slowly taking up the rear in his long meditative strides. He might even be carrying a new book for Claude to read, see the myth of Philoctetes and Neoptolemus, which he will tell Claude reminds him so much of their own relationship, the healthy young god and the sick old warrior, and all such twaddle. I tell you, it was awful. I have notes about everything that was going on. Claude kept yelling stuff about a new vision, which he'd gleaned out of Rambo, Nietzsche, Yates, Rilke, Alyosha, Karamazov, anything. Erwin Garden was his closest student friend. Um, also, just so everyone knows, Erwin Garden is uh, the name for Allen Ginsberg. Erwin. I was sitting in Johnny's apartment one day when the door opened and in walks this spindly Jewish kid with horn-rimmed glasses and tremendous ears sticking out, 17 years old, burning black eyes, and a strangely deep mature voice. He looks at me and says, discretion is the better part of valor. Oh, where's my food? I yelled at Johnny because that's precisely all I had on my mind in the moment he walked in. Turns out, it took years for Irwin to get over a certain fear of the brooding football artist yelling for his supper in Big Daddy chair or some such. 
I didn't like him anyway. One look at him, a few days of knowing him to avouch my private claim, and I came to the conclusion that he was a lecher who wanted everybody in the world to take a bath in the same huge bathtub which would give him a chance to feel legs under the dirty water. This is precisely the image I had of him on first meeting. Johnny also felt he was repugnant in this sense. Claude liked him, always has, and was amused, entertained. They wrote poems together, manifestos of the new vision, rushed around with books, had bull sessions in Claude's Dalton Hall room where he hardly ever slept, took Johnny and Cecily out to ballets and stuff downtown when I was in Long Island visiting my folks. They tell me that Claude started a commotion in the ballet balcony, the ushers were coming with flashing lights. He led the gang out through some strange door, and they found themselves in the labyrinths underneath the Metropolitan Opera House, running into dressing rooms, some of them occupied, out again, around, back and forth, and triumphantly emerged somewhere on 7th Avenue and got away. That on the way home, in the crowded subway, all four of them, laughing and gay, Claude suddenly yelled out over everybody's heads, When they put the cattle in the cars, they copulate! All such Joe College stuff. Not bad style. In that same light, Claude sort of looked at me as some kind of lout, which was true. Franz Mueller was jealous of Irwin, of me, of anybody Claude had anything to do with, especially of the blonde college girl Cecily. A bougie kitten, Claude called her. And one lilac dusk, when we were all exhausted and asleep in the mad pad on sixth floor, Will Hubbard and Franz came in quietly, saw Claude on the couch in Cecily's arms, and Mueller said, Doesn't he look pale, as though he were being sucked dry by a vampire? One night, the same two came in, but found an empty apartment, so to amuse himself that no good pederast Mueller took my little cat, wrapped Hubbard's tie around its neck, and tried to hang it from the lamp. A little kitty. Will Hubbard immediately took it down, undamaged and just slightly hurt, I guess, in the neck. I don't know. I wasn't there. I would have thrown that man out the window. It was only told to me much later on. Okay, so this is a reference to, um, apparently... Uh, David Kammerer getting jealous that Lucian was hanging out with Jack Kerouac all the time and trying to hang Jack Kerouac's cat. Chapter 2. Then sometimes Mueller would catch me alone and talk to me long and earnestly over beers, but always the same intention, to find out what Claude did or said behind his back, that is, behind his knowing, and who he saw, what, where, all the anguished questioning of a lover. He even patted me on the back, and he gave me detailed instructions to say this, that, to arrange meetings one way or the other. Claude was avoiding him more than ever. Their past was unbelievable. It was exactly like Rambeau and Verlaine. In Tulane University, Claude became depressed, blocked up his all his apartment windows, put a pillow in the oven, his head on the pillow, and turned on the gas. But the amazing thing is that Mueller happened at that moment to be riding by on horseback, of all things, with a socialite girl, of all things. He was always after making women so he could get closer to Claude. This was one of Claude's casual dolls. Mueller quite accidentally got off the horse, smelled the gas at the door, broke it down, and dragged the kid out in the hall. Um, so I'm assuming they mean one of uh, Fran's or David's casual dolls, not Claude's. I'm not really sure. And, um, yeah, apparently this oven thing happened where, um, Lucian tried to commit suicide and then, um, they reference it in the movie Kill Your Darlings that apparently David Kammerer rescued him. Um, but also in the movie Kill Your Darlings, uh, it's kind of implied that the reason that he tried to commit suicide by sticking his head in the oven, which he wrote off as a art demonstration, was because, uh, he was being stalked by David Kammerer. On another occasion, after that, and before Bowling Green or Andover or someplace, they actually got Coast Guard passes and Siemens papers and shipped out of Baltimore or someplace, but were thrown off the ship in New York uh, on some beef, but I never got clear. Wherever Claude went, Mueller followed. Claude's mother even tried to have the man arrested. At the time, Hubbard, Fran's closest friend, remonstrated again and again with him to go off someplace and find another boy more amenable, go to sea, Go to South America, live in the jungle, go marry Cindy Lou in Virginia. Mueller came from aristocrats somewhere. No, it was the romantic and fatal attachment. I could understand it myself because for the first time in my life, I found myself stopping in the street and thinking, wonder where Claude is now? What's he doing right now? And going off to find him. 
I mean, like that feeling you get during a love affair. It was a very nostalgic season in hell. There was the nostalgia of Johnny and me in love, Claude and Cecily in love, Franz in love with Claude, Hubbard hovering like a shadow, Garden, Erwin Garden, which is Allen Ginsberg, in love with Claude, and Hubbard and me and Cecily, and Johnny and Franz. The war, the second front, which occurred just before this time, the poetry, the soft city evenings, the cries of Rambeau, New Vision, the great Goddardamerung, the love song, You Always Hurt the One You Love, the smell of beers and smoke in the West End bar, the evenings we spent on the grass by the Hudson River on Riverside Drive at 116th Street watching the Rose West, watching the freighters slide by, Claude saying to me, whispering, gotta get away from Mueller, let's get you and me ship out, don't tell a soul about this. Let's try to get a ship to France. That one there is probably going to France. We'll land at the second front. We'll walk to Paris. I'll be a deaf mute and you speak country French and we'll pretend we're peasants. When we get to Paris, it will probably be on the verge of being liberated. We'll find symbols saturated in the gutters of Mont Montmartre. We'll write poetry, paint, drink red wine, wear berets. I feel like I'm in a pond that's drying out and I'm about to suffocate. I suppose you understand. If you don't, let's just do it anyway. Franz, he's desperate enough to kill me anyway. Chapter 3 So during the days, we now started to hang around the NMU hall, waiting for our turn to come up for a ship. Evenings, we rejoined Hubbard at his apartment around the corner down 7th Avenue to Greenwich Village, because he was always working, and his monthly trust fund check and always uh, had his monthly trust fund check and always bought us fine dinners in Romley Marie's, in San Remo's, in Minetta's, and inevitably Franz would always find us and join in. Claude was a great one for what Andre Guide called an acte gratuity, the gratuitous act, the doing of an act just for the hell of it. Seeing his veal parmesan didn't taste too hot in one of the restaurants, he simply picked up the plate, said, this is crap, and threw it back over his shoulder with just a flick of the wrist, no expression, suavely picking up his glass of wine to sip, and nobody saw him do it except us. The waiter even rushed up apologetically to pick up the pieces. Or in a diner at dawn, he'd hold up dripping egg whites from his fork and say to the waitress dryly, You call this midden and a half eggs? Or when we had a big steak in Will's room, he'd pick it up before Will could start to cut it into four sections and start raunching on it with greasy fingers, and seeing that we were all just amused, would start growling like a tiger, and then Franz would jump into the act and try to wrestle the steak from his fingers, and they'd rip it apart with their claws. Hey, I'd yell, my steak. Ah, the louse, all you think about is food, you beefy clout. One time, he leaped up on Jane Street to grab at overhanging branches in the evening, and Franz sighed to Will, isn't he wonderful? Or another time vaulted over a fence, and Franz tried it too, missed. You could hear, as Hubbard says, his joints creak. In the effort to keep up with a young man like that, 19, it was really sad. I didn't know about the cat then, anyway, luckily. Another evening, Claude saw a hole in the sleeve of Will's seersucker suit, stuck his finger in it, and ripped half the coat off. His bones creaking, Franz jumped in and grabbed the other sleeve and yanked it off, wrapped it around Hubbard's head, ripped up the back of the coat over his head, and then they stood around making strips of it, tied them together, and made a festoon over chandeliers and bookcases all over the room. It was done in perfect good humor. Hubbard just sat there with his lips compressed, going pfunk down his nose. Like a bunch of Luftwaffe blades on a night off, they all had all the right in the world to do anything they felt like. And of course, to a Lowell boy like me, destroying a coat was strange, but to them, they all came from well-to-do families. Okay, so this is kind of talking about how Jack Kerouac wasn't really as rich as the rest of them. Um, he came from Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, yeah, the some of these pranks, like the steak thing and stuff, are referenced in um, others of their biographies, like And the Hippos Were Boiled in Their Tanks, which was written by Jack Kerouac and William S. Burroughs. Chapter 4. Mueller finally got wind of what we were doing, would trail us down 14th Street and around the corner to the Union Hall, hiding in doorways. Finally, we found him in the Union Hall with a pleading look, saying, Look, I knew what you were up to, so I did something about it. I arranged a lunch for the three of us with the girl upstairs who's in charge of shipping calls and such. I talked to her yesterday before you got here and this afternoon. Look at this. 
I swiped a dozen sailing cards off her deck, and here they are, Claude. Put them in your pocket. Now listen, I can do this, and a whole lot of other things. With my help, we can all ship out the three of us in no time at all. There won't be any of this waiting around. Naturally, when Franz is out of earshot, Claude says to me, But the whole point of shipping out is to get away from him. Now what do I do? That night, we all wind up with the girls, and Will too, at Minetta Lane, where old Joel Gould, leading his bearded chin on his cane, looks at Cecily and says, I'm a lesbian. I love women. So we all go to uh, a harmless little party on McDougal Street, eluding Fran somehow as he's going around the corner to find something. We're sitting there in that typical New York style late night party jabber, and we hear the marquee of the bar downstairs groaning and cracking. And then we see that someone is climbing it, coming into the window. Boom, it's Franz Mueller. In fact, as things got worse and Franz grew more desperate, one night, according to what he told Will, he climbed the fire escape in back of Dalton Hall and went up to Claude's third floor window. The window was wide open. He went in and found Claude asleep in the dark of the moon in the window. He stood there, he said, for about a half hour, just looking down at him, silently, reverently, hardly breathing. Then he went out. As he was jumping the fence, he was caught by the apartment hotel guard and hauled into the front foyer at gunpoint and harangued by the night clerk. The cops were called, and he had to wave papers and explain. They had to call Claude and wake him up and come down and confirm that he had been drinking with Mueller in his room all night. My God, said Hubbard, laughing with compressed lips. <laughs> Supposing you'd have found the wrong room and hovered over a perfect stranger. Um, so this event was also referenced in uh, the bio and the hippos were boiled in their tanks about how David Cameron climbed up the fire escape to uh, enter into Lucian's room and watch him sleep reportedly for a half hour before he left and was found by security. Chapter five. In a burst of angry inspiration, I went straight to the big shot desk in the union and I said I was waiting an awful long time for a ship. So what? Let's see your old discharges. Suddenly he whooped when he saw the old Dorchester discharge. The Dorchester? You were on the Dorchester? For Christ's sakes, why didn't you tell me? Any ex-crewman of that ship gets special treatment around here. I can tell you that, brother. Here. Here's your cards. Go down and give them to Blackie. You'll get a ship in a day or two. Glad times, brother. I was amazed. Claude and I had opportunity to rejoice we decided to go out to Long Island and see my folks. In the bar across the street, my father, in white August shirt sleeves of beery night, looked at Claude crossways and said, All right, then, I'm going to buy a rich man's son a drink. A shadow crossed Claude's face. He told me later he never liked that. If that isn't typical of the Deleuze's, I'll never know what is. Why did he have to bring it up just then? You Claude's of romantic gasland. I don't like that, Claude, says me paw to me privately that night. He looks like a mischievous young punk. He's going to get you into trouble. So will that little Johnny Podley of yours and that Hubbard I keep hearing about. What are you doing hanging around with such low-down bunch as that? Can't you find good young friends anymore? Imagine telling me that in the midst of my symbolist poet period, with Claude and me yelling at the dark bridge waters, um, and then there's a phrase in French here, but it says to plunge to the bottom of the abyss, heaven or hell, what matter? And all those other Rambo sayings, and Nietzschean, and here we are guaranteed to sail in no time at all, and we're going to be symbolist Isidore Ducasses, and Apollinaires, and Baudelaire's, and Lautremont's, all together in very Paris itself. Uh, again, don't know if I'm pronouncing those right, sorry for butchering. Years later, I met an infantryman who was in the second front at exactly this time, who said, When I heard you and that de Maubry guy were going to jump ship in France and walk to Paris to become poets behind the lines, pretending to be peasants, I wanted to find you and bump your heads together. But he forgets that we really intended to do it and almost did, and this was done before the St. Lo breakthrough, too. Okay, so basically Lucian and Jack Kerouac wanted to ship out to France and um, probably the main reason that, that Lucian wanted to ship out was to escape David Kammerer since he didn't know how to cut ties with him. Chapter 6. The call did come one afternoon. I'd written a paper for Claude, who was more intelligent but lazier than I was. He'd handed it in in hopes of getting some kind of appeasing form 
from the professors of Columbia, and off we went to the Union Hall and grabbed our call. The call was a liberty bound for the second front. We rushed off to Hoboken via the subway, a crosstown walk to North River and the ferry. But when we got to the pier, they told us she had shifted to a pier on Brooklyn at the foot of Joralamon Street again. So we had to wrangle our way all the way back across the river on the ferry in heavy smoke now as there was a waterfront fire on the Jersey side, a smoke I felt was surprisingly thick, inauspicious, commenting on something that was going to go wrong, then down to Brooklyn and down to the ship. There she was. But as we were crossing the long pier with our passes and papers all clear and our gear on our back singing, hi, he ho, Davy Jones, and what do you do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? And all the seamen songs, a bunch of guys from our ship came marching up the other direction and said, you guys going on the SS Robert Hayes? Well, don't sign on. I'm on the, bo- I'm the bosun. I'm also the delicate of the ship. There's something wrong with the chief mate. He's a fascist. We're going to see about having him replaced. Go on board, occupy your fox sleigh, stow your gear, eat, but don't sign on. I should have known better because when we came up the gangplank, we were met in the alleyway by the port official who said, All right, stash your gear, boys, and go into the captain's office to sign on for this voyage. That sounded more like it, but Claude and I wondered what to do, really. We wondered if we'd be thrown off the ship by the Union if we did sign. We hung around the fox sleigh, I don't know what that is, um, F-O-C apostrophe S-L-E, discussing it. We put away our clothes and went down to the stores below, found a huge can of ice-cold milk, dairy can, five gallons, and drank most of it, chawing on cold roast beef meanwhile. We walked around the ship trying to figure out the complicated lines and ropes and winches. We'll learn! On the poop deck, we looked toward the towers of Manhattan, right across the river, and Claude said, Well, by God, at last I'll be free of FM, Franz Mueller or David Kammerer. But just then, a great big red-headed mate who looked exactly like Franz Mueller without a beard came storming at us and said, Are you the two boys who just walked on board? Yeah. Well, weren't you told to go sign up in the captain's mess? Yeah. But the bosun told us to wait. Oh, did he now? Yeah, he said there was some kind of beef. Listen, wise guy. Beef is right. I saw you two bums go down in the stores and eat beef and drink milk. That's your beef. Leave some money on this ship to pay for that beef. Pick up your gear and get off. You're fired along with the bosun and all the rest of you no good bastards. We're going to get a crew on this ship if it's the last thing I do, you cocksucking no good little pearly ass punks. But we didn't know. Never mind the we didn't know. You know well enough you sign up on a ship or you don't. Now get in that foxley, get out that gear, and beat it, and beat it good. He was such a big guy, I was afraid to get into explanations. He just didn't want explanations. Also, he scared me. As for that Claude, he was as pale as a sheet. Here we went, five minutes later, straggling back down the long, cool pier with our gear on our backs, headed for the hot sun of the hot, murderous streets of New York at four o'clock in the afternoon. So sunny hot, in fact. We had to stop for Cokes with our last few dimes at a little store. Claude looked at me. I looked down. I should have known better. On the other hand, what was that silly bosun up to, trying to get his own friends on the ship? And it was bound for the second front, too. War. Uh, War bonus pay and no more danger from German artillery, either. I'll never know. Chapter 7. Oh, and so the previous chapter, um, that's kind of the the day that David Kammerer um, is murdered. And it's always described as this very, very hot day without AC um, in the middle of New York City in August. Chapter 7. I'm neglecting Johnny, of course, who in those days looked about what Mommy Van Doren looks like today. Same build, height, with the same almost bucktooth grin. That eager grin and laugh and eagerness and tire that makes the eyes slit, but at the same time makes the cheeks fuller and endows the lady with the promise that she will look good all her life. No lines of drawness. As Claude and I return from that long, foolish day, throw our gear on the floor, the apartment is all darkened, sun going down, Union Theological Seminary bell tolling, nobody in there but Cecily sleeping on the sofa in a litter of books, bottles, empties, butts, manuscripts. Without turning on the light, Claude immediately lies down beside her on the couch and holds her tight. I go into Johnny's and my bedroom and lie down and take a nap. 
grinning, Johnny comes in about an hour later with some food she bought after borrowing a few bucks from a funeral director she knows, and we have a gay supper in our bare feet. Ha ha ha, chides Johnny. So you two bastards ain't going to France after all. I shouldn't have wasted my good film on those pictures I took of you yesterday afternoon thinking I'd never see either one of you again. These pictures, in the sunlight of the plaza of field stones in front of Low Memorial Library, Columbia University, show Claude and I leaning casually, one leg up on a fountainside, smoking, frowning. Tough guy, sea dogs. Another one is of Claude alone with arms hanging at sides with a butt in hand, looking like a child of the rainbow, as Irwin later calls him in a poem. Some rainbow. Claude and I later go down to the West End bar to drink a few beers and discuss our next attempt at the Union Hall. He gets into a big metaphysical argument with Roy Plantagenet or somebody, and I go home to sleep some more, or read, or take a shower. As I'm passing the St. Paul's Chapel on the campus and going down the old wood steps they had there, here comes Mueller, boundering eagerly, bearded in the gloom. Up my way, sees me, says, Where's Claude? In the West End. Thanks, I'll see you later. And I watch him rush off to his death. So they hung out a lot at the West End Bar um, in New York, uh, which I guess is no longer there. And um, yeah, so let's see. Um, yeah, this image, uh, this photograph that they're talking about um, that was taken at the Columbia University Library where they're putting their leg up on um, on the fountain is a probably one of the most famous photos of, of Lucian Carr. It's of Lucian Carr and, and Jack Kerouac, and it looks like Edie must have taken it. Um, it's black and white. They're both looking good in it. <clears throat> Chapter eight. Because at dawn, I'm woke up from my sleep at the side of Johnny. It's been so hot, we had to open the clawed sofa and spread it afar with wide sheets in the breeze crossway of windows. And there's Claude standing over me with his blonde hair in his eyes, shaking me by the arm. But I'm not really asleep either. He says, well, I disposed of the old man last night. And I know exactly what he means. Not that I was Ivan Karamazov to his Smerdyakov, but I knew. But I said, why'd you go and do that? No time for that now. I've still got the knife and his glasses covered with blood. Want to come with me, see what we can do to dump him? What in the hell did you go and do that for? I repeated, sighing, as though someone had woke me up from the news of a new leak in the cellar or in the kitchen sink there's another cat turd. But I raise my weary bones like a seaman has to do another and watch as and watch and I go shower, dress in chinos and a t-shirt, and come back to see him standing in the window, looking out on the alley, bemused. What did you really do? I stabbed him in the heart twelve times with my Boy Scout knife. What for? He jumped me. He said I love you and all that stuff, and couldn't live without me, and he was going to kill me, kill both of us. Last I saw, you were with Plantagenet. Yeah, but he came in. We drank, went down to the Hudson River grass, had a bottle. I stripped off his white shirt, tore it into strips, tied rocks with strips and tied the strips to his arms and legs, took all my clothes off and pushed him in. He wouldn't sink. That's why I had to take my clothes off. After, I had to wade in, in to my chin level and give him a push. Then he floated off somewhere, upside down. Then my clothes was there on the grass, dry. It's hot, as you know. I put it on, hailed a cab on Riverside Drive, and went to ask Hubbard what to do. In the village? He answered the door in his bathrobe, and I handed him a bloody pack of luckies, and he said, Have the last cigarette. Like you, he seemed to sense what happened, you might say. He put on his best Claude Rains manner and paced up and down, flushed the luckies down the toilet, told me to plead self-defense, which is what it was, for God's sake, Jack. I'm going to get the hot seat anyway. No, you ain't. I've got this here knife, these eyeglasses of poor old Franz. All he kept saying was, so this is how Franz Mueller ends. He turned away like a seaman, turning away to cry, but didn't cry. He couldn't cry. I guess he'd cried enough already. Then Hubbard told me to give myself up, call my grandmother and get a good New Orleans lawyer and give myself up. But I just wanted to see you, old boy, have a final drink with you. Okay, I says. I've just picked up three bucks from Johnny last night. How much you got? We'll go out and get drunk. Hubbard gave me a fiver. Let's go down to Harlem. On the way, I can dump the glasses and the knife in the weeds down there in Morningside Park. 
In fact, we were running down the six flights of stairs as we were saying this, and suddenly I thought of poor Johnny sleeping there, not knowing a thing. So when we hit the street, I told Claude to wait a second, and I rushed back up the stairs double time, two, three steps at a time, in all that, in all that heat, puffing, just to go in and plant a little unwaking kiss on her, that she remembered, she said later, <clears throat> and then ran down again to Claude, and we took off down 118th and down the stone steps of Morningside Park. All of the rooftops of Harlem and the Bronx further, you could see spewing up heat and smoke of August of 1944, a disgusting heat already in the early morning. In the bushes down near the bottom, I said, I'll pretend I'm taking a leak here, look around real anxious to draw attention to anybody watching, and you just bury the glasses and the knife. By God, I had the right instinct. In a previous lifetime, it must have been where I learned this. I certainly didn't learn it in this one. But anyway, he did just that, kicked some clods, dropped the glasses, kicked clods back over them, rimless, sad, and then some leafy twigs, and we walked on. Hands of pockets, wearing just t-shirts and alone, the two of us towards the bars of Harlem. In front of the bar on 125th Street, I said, There, look, a good subway grate. That's where money keeps falling down and little kids put bubblegum on the ends of long sticks and gum it up. Drop the knife down and in there and let's go, and let's go in this cool zebra-striped lounge and have a cold beer. Which he did, but instead of hiding now in full view of everybody, he dramatically knelt at the grate and let the knife drop from his stiff fingers, very dramatically, as though this was the one thing he really didn't want to hide. But it fell, hit the grate, stuck there, he kicked it, and it fell down six feet to the gum wrappers and junk below. Nobody who saw him cared anyway. The knife, the Boy Scout knife I suppose he had when he was 14 and joined the Boy Scouts to learn woodcraft but only ran into the Marquis de Sadie Scoutmaster, lay there now, probably among a stash of dropped heroin, marijuana, other knives, cundrums, what all. <clears throat> we went into the air-conditioned bars and sat at cool swivel stools and ordered cold beers. I'll get the hot seat for sure. I'll burn and sing, sing. Sing, you sinners, boy. Ah, oh, come on. Will's right. It's just a question of defending your whole goddamn life from... Remember that movie we saw last week with Cecily and Johnny? Le Grande Illusions? John Gavin is the peasant soldier, Claude Labrie de la Merde, or whatever his name was, who wears the white gloves. They escape from the German prison camp together. You're Gavin, you're the peasant, and me, my white gloves are starting to chafe. Get off that. My ancestors were Breton barons. You're full of you-know-what. I wouldn't look it up even if it was true, because I do know they must have been peasantish barons. But he said it all so kindly, in a soft voice, and it didn't matter. What we gotta do today is get drunk, borrow some money even, then I'll give myself up in the evening. I'll go home to Master Sister, as prophesied. I'll get the chair for sure. I'll burn. He died in my arms. So that's the story of Franz Mueller. He kept saying, so that's how it ends. So that's what happened to me. Happened, mind you, like it already happened before. I should have stayed in England where I was born. I stabbed him in the heart, that section here, 12 times. I pushed him in the river with all those rocks. He went off floating with his feet upside down, his head's down below, all those ships going by. We missed that damn ship in Brooklyn. I knew something would go wrong when we missed that damn ship. That damn first mate with the red hair looked like Mueller. Let's take a subway downtown, go see a movie or something. No, let's take a cab and go see my psychiatrist. I'll borrow a five from him. And we went out in the street, hailed a cab immediately, hove in sight rode down to Park Avenue and went out in a fancy foyer up in an elevator, and I waited outside while he went in and confessed to his psychiatrist. He came out with a $5 bill and said, let's go. He washes his hands. Let's go fast around the corner and down to Lex. He probably doesn't believe me. We kept walking and came to Third Avenue where we saw the movie Four Feathers announced on a marquee. Let's go in there. We come in there just about in time for the beginning of J. Arthur Rank's production and said, Four Feathers, in which there is a fellow called Hubbard in the story. We both winced to hear the name in the dialogue. The picture is technicolor. Suddenly thousands of fuzzy wuzzies and English soldiers are, hack are hacking and massacring on all sides the Battle of the Nile near Khartoum. They can murder them by the thousands, says Claude in The Dark Show. Chapter 9 we came out of there and idled down Fifth Avenue to the Museum of Modern Art, where Claude comes to a meditative shop before a portrait by Amedio Modigliani, for some reason his favorite modern painter. 
A queer is standing in the back, watching Claude intently, drifting around, coming around again to get another look at him. Claude either does or doesn't notice, but I do. We stop in front of Chaletichu's famous painting, Caché Caché, and delight in all the little touches of little wombs, little fetuses, fetai? Sperm coming out of blossoms, that marvelous painting that was damaged in a fire decades later, or decade and a half. We then go down through Times Square and down to the NMU Hall, just for nostalgia's sake, I guess. Claude says, that Sabbath of yours used to moon around the streets of New York's and Lowell with you, with all his poems about, hello out there, and we'll go no more a-roaming. Wish I'd have met him. So, um, so apparently this is true. They apparently did go to the Museum of Modern Art to look at paintings after uh, the murder of David, and um, Jack did help him hide the glasses and knife. And um, later on, apparently, the police uh, at first didn't believe that he had done the murder because he seemed like a well-to-do, you know, intelligent, educated boy. But then when he showed them the knife and glasses, they realized that he was telling them the truth. Chapter 10. We eat hot dogs, have to eat, walk around, come back up 3rd Avenue, inching back toward his aunt's house at 57th Street thereby, stop in a bar, and two sailors accost us asking to know where they can find girls for hire. I tell them the letters to your son hotel. At the time, this was right. Then Claude says, See this vest I'm wearing? It was Fran's. It's also covered with blood. What do I do with it? When we leave the bar, just drop it in the gutter, I guess. These white gloves are chafing. You want them, peasant? Okay, hand them over. He goes through the routine of imaginarily handing me them white gloves. In a gesture, as Jenny would say. But with me, it's just dumb show and he don't know what to do. Allow me grammatical lapses as well, laid on clearly in every bar from here to St. Petersburg. Chapter 11. So in the third avenue, late afternoon, he just drops the vest, sort of leather, in the gutter, nobody cares, and says, Now I go up two blocks alone, turn right to 57th Street, tell my aunt, she calls lawyers on Wall Street, and as we've got connections, you know, and I don't ever see you anymore. Yes, you will. In any case, I'm off now. It's been a grand day, old boy. And head down, he plunges up on the street, fists in pockets, and does the right turn. Just then, a big truck saying, Ruby, South Carolina, rumbles and thunders by. I, and I think of hopping it, yelling, ha ha, and getting out of town to go see myself again. But first, I gotta go see Johnny. But of course, the New York police are faster than that. I go see Johnny, don't tell her anything. But in the evening, the door knocks and in saunters real casual-like, two plainclothesmen who begin to look at the drawers and turn books over. Johnny yells, what the hell is this? Claude has confessed he killed Franz last night on the river. Killed Franz? How? Why didn't you tell me? Is that why you kissed me when you left with him this morning? Tell these guys I think Mueller deserved it. Easy, young lady. Anything around here? Asked the cop, looking at me with frank blue eyes. Just a simple case of self-defense, nothing to hide. You're coming with us, you know that, don't you? For what? Material witness. Don't you know that when someone confesses a homicide to you, you're supposed to tell the police right off? And where is the murder weapon? We dropped it in a grade in Harlem. Well, there you are. You're an accessory after the fact. We'll take you down to the local precinct, but wait a couple of 15 minutes or so. There's some photographers down there waiting to take your picture. Picture? Why? They took Claude's picture already, boy. I'm telling you. Just sit easy. As long... Hey, Charlie. Okay, see you down at the precinct. Charlie leaves, and after a half hour of sitting, we go off, in his car, to the precinct, down 98th Street, and I'm ushered into a cell with a board for a bed. No windows, who cares, and I curl up and try to sleep. But there's noise all night. Jailer comes to my bars at midnight and says, You're lucky, kid. There was a big bunch of photographers from the New York papers waiting for you for a half hour. Um, okay, so this part is true, um, or I think that, like, photographers were trying to take his picture, um, and that was also depicted in the movie Kill Your Darlings, and I think, uh, people were particularly interested in this, uh, in terms of, like, newsmen and stuff, because, you know, this was a murder involving a high-profile family and very prestigious university, Columbia. Chapter 12. So in the morning, I like my arresting officer, who thought of the half hour, and he comes back, quiet, burps saying he had a heavy breakfast, says, come on, has blue eyes, is a Jewish plainclothesman, 
and we go downtown to the DA's office for all the paperwork and interrogation. He drives placidly down the West Side Highway, slowly and saying, nice day, for some reason, he realizes I am not a dangerous prisoner. I am ushered into the district attorney's office. It's Jacob Grummet at the time, little mustache, Jewish too, pacing swiftly up and down, papers flying. He says to me, first off, kid, there's a letter we received this morning from the YMCA on 34th Street. Here, sit down. I read this letter in pencil saying, I told you Claude was bad and that he would kill. When we met in the El Gaucho show that night and I told you, ha, you wouldn't believe. He is a rat. I've always told you so ever since I met you in 1934 and so on. I look up at Grummet and say, this is a fraud. Okay, filing it. Every homicide case of this kind, some letters like this show up. Why particularly is this letter a fraud? Because, laughing, I... In 1934, I was 12 years old, and I never heard of El Gaucho, and I don't know a soul in the 34th Street YMCA. God bless your soul, says the DA. And now, kiddo, here's Detective Sergeant O'Toole, who's going to take you to the outer office and ask you a further question. Me and O'Toole go into the other room. He says, sit down. Smoke? Cigarette. I light. I look out the window at the pigeons and the heat, and suddenly O'Toole, a big Irishman with a gat on his chest under his coat. What would you do if a queer made a grab at your cock? Why, I'd nork him, I answered straight away, looking right at him, because suddenly that's what I thought he was going to do. Note, nork is Times Square expression for knock, sometimes known then as knees work. But anyway, O'Toole immediately takes me back to the DA's office, and DA says, well? And O'Toole yawns and says, oh, he's okay, he's a swordsman. Well, that was no Cornish lie. Then the DA said to me, you're very close to having become an accessory after the fact of this homicide because of your assistance, nay, advice to the accused, in burying and concealing the weapon and evidence. But we understand that most people don't know the law. That is, a material witness is a witness after the fact who's been apprised of the fact by the accused but doesn't bring it to the attention of the law, or before the fact. You went out and got drunk with the accused. You helped him bury and dump the evidence. We understand that not only you don't or didn't know this aspect of the law, but most guys would act the same way in the same, in the same circumstances with, as you might say, their buddies or friends who are not habitual criminals. But you're not out of hot water yet. Either as accessory after the fact or as a guest in the Bronx jail, which we call the Bronx Opera House, where pigeons sing areas, and you're never going to be out of hot water until we find this kid guilty of murder instead of manslaughter. Now, the Daily News is calling this an honor slaying, which means the kid was defending his honor from a known homosexual, who was also, by the way, much bigger. We've got the record here of how the guy followed him around the country from one school to another, getting him in trouble and getting him expelled. The case hinges on whether Claude de Maubry is a homosexual. We're trying to establish whether he is. You are, or whatever. O'Toole, O'Toole thinks you're not a homo. Are you? I told O'Toole I wasn't. Is Claude? No, not in the least. If he was, he'd have tried to make me. Now we have this other material witness, Hubbard, whose father just flew, him, flew in from out west with a five grand in cash and bailed him out. Is he a homo? Not that I know of. All right, I believe you. You might be lucky and then again you may not. Your wife is down the hall if you want to go see her. She's not married to me. That's what she told us, among other things. She's pregnant, ain't she? Grinning. Of course not. We'll go down and see her and wait there. I've got to talk to Dame Mabry now. I go down into the hall with O'Toole. They bring Johnny. We talk and cry in an office. And like in Jimmy Cagney movies, when the time's up, they tell us it's time. She cries, hugs me, holds me. She wants to be dragged away like in the movies. I see Claude being led down the hall by two guards. They bring me a daily news showing pictures of Claude on the river grass, pointing to where he dumped Franz. Headlines say honor slaying and call him a scion of a European family. I mean it. Headlines in the New York Daily News. I must say they must have been starved for news in those days. I guess they were sick of Patton's tanks busting on the German front and wanted a little spicy scandal. Chapter 13 they bring me the early evening edition of the New York Journal American, and it shows a photo of a handsome blonde Claude being led by cops into a tombs entryway, the tombs jail down on Chamber Street, and he's holding two slim volumes in his hands. God knows where he picked them up. 
I guess at his aunt's house or something, to read during the proceedings. The books are described by the Journal American as a vision by William Butler Keats. That's right, Keats and A Season in Hell by Jean Arthur Rimbaud. Okay, so I think there's actually some photos of him that are in black and white where he is actually um, uh, in the, the jail and he's holding these books. Then, lo, on the bench in the waiting room, beside Johnny, Cecily and the other questionees is Erwin Garden, all eager with a bunch of books and leaning forward from the edge of his bench, ready to be interrogated. He wants to explain the new vision to the DA and to all the newspapers of New York. He's only 17 and only a minor, in fact, completely useless witness. But he wants to be in on it all the way, not like Snitkin, really, but more like the old literature in The Possessed. It's his first big chance to get in the newspapers. He, who, a year ago at 16, had vowed on the Hoboken Ferry, I shall devote my life to the liberation of the working class. Though the only honest lick of work he ever done in his life was when he was a busboy in California cafeteria and shoved his mop cloth right in my kisser when I said something unnicetized about his slavish position, calling him a Puerto Rican non-entity busboy in a nowhere void. But bless Irwin, Claude, Johnny, even Franz, the DA, O'Toole, the whole lot. It was all done and done as a fact. <clears throat> so this was um, their new vision, which they based off of Yates' a vision. Um, Lucian Carr and Allen and William S. Burroughs and all of them kind of wrote it together. And it was like challenging the previous writing rules. And uh, yeah, it was like their kind of manifesto. And I think Alan was using the court case as an opportunity to kind of like spread that via media or via like public eye. Chapter 14. It started to pour cats and dogs and Claude and I together again now with cops go briefly in some alleyways and paddy wagons to a judge's bench not far from Chambers Street and are arraigned or whatever they call it. But in the drenching roar of that rain, which dins throughout that courtroom like invasions and attacks from outside, Claude takes advantage to say to me out of the corner of his mouth, heterosexuality all the way down the line. I know, you jape, because after all, what else? And you jape, I only just added now. In those days, I just said, I know. Then after another night on 98th Street Precinct, I'm brought before another judge, Star Chamber or something, with lots of people there. And as always, the judge winks at me. Every time I face a judge, he winks at me. And the judge sings, and it's still raining out. Well, as the old Swedish sailmaker said to the old Norwegian sailor, a sailor is safer in a storm, a sailor is safer in a storm at sea than he is on land. Hor hor hor, and he signed things and banged gavels. But to my surprise, it said in the paper the next day that I was whistling a tune while all this was going on, which I don't doubt because when I was young, I heard a tune in my head. I simply just whistled it, and knowing the hit song of that summer, I'm sure I must have been whistling. You always hurt the one you love. A big bunch of people rushed up to me. After a certain to-do was done with on the bench. I turned. I thought it was a mob of eager law students, so that every question they asked me, I gave a precise answer. My full name, birthplace, hometown, present address, etc. And only afterwards, my kind of plains clothes men sighed in the car as he drove me up to Bronx jail, saying, My God, man, those were newspaper people. Didn't you know that? I thought they were lawyers taking notes. You, now your father's going to see your name in the paper and your mother too? What did the judge mean by land and sea? That was some joke? He's a card, Judge Moonahan. We drove up to the Bronx Opera House. Now listen, Jack. This is the jail where all material witnesses to homicides are kept. You're not under arrest, understand this. You're simply what we call detained. You're going to be paid three bucks a day while you stay here. The reason why we keep material witnesses to homicides in here, that is to say, people who know about certain killings, is so that when the trial comes up, he, you, the material witness, won't be hiding out in Detroit or someplace, or Montevideo, and, but, you're going in here with the same floor with all the material witnesses of the killings of New York, which includes murder incorporated boys, so take it easy and don't let them scare you. Just keep your nose clean, read those boys in silence, study those books we picked up for you, and that there's cakes and ales, is it? By Somerset Man and sleep most of the time. You can play handball on the roof. Most of these guys are Italians. They come from the old syndicate in Brooklyn Murder Incorporated. They're all serving over 199 years. And what they got to do is get a confession out of guys like you that can lop 50 years off their convictions. But since you've got nothing to confess, just take it easy. 
Tomorrow I'll be over and see you for probably the last time. I gotta drive you to the Bellevue morgue to identify the body of Franz Mueller, which they just found in the river. Um, so this was true. They really hadn't fully believed the murder happened until they found um, David Kammerer's body flowing down the Hudson River. And um, You Always Hurt the One You Love is a song that plays a lot um, throughout the movie Kill Your Darlings in the soundtrack. <clears throat> But yeah, according to Edie Parker's bio, um, she talked about how they had to test or prove to see whether um, like Lucian Carr and his friends, including Jack Kerouac, were gay. Like they offered prisoners money if they could somehow seduce Jack in the prison. Chapter 16. The gates of each individual cell are slaying shut at 10 and we all go to sleep. And oh boy, a cold wave has suddenly hit New York from the Northwest and I actually have to wrap up in my flimsy blanket even have to get up and put on all my clothes, reach down for the bite of my chocolate candy bars, and see by the dim hall light that a mouse has already taken a few nibbles out of it. But I've got my little individual toilet bowl, little individual sink, and in the morning there's breakfast, which though it's only dry old French toast, at least there's syrup to go on them, a little coffee, and okay. My wonderful Jewish plainclothes men comes and drives me down to Bellevue Morgue through all kinds of interesting clanging doors, and we come there, are told to wait till the coroner is done have to go down and see district attorney again and spend a dull afternoon smoking cigarettes on benches in the anteroom. He tells me I can get out on bail bond, by the way. But the DA comes out in late afternoon and does indeed say, Well, you're all right, kid. We've checked out everything and you'll be okay. You're not going to be an accessory after the fact. And if Claude cops out on a manslaughter plea, there will be no trial and you'll be free and paid for your time in the opera house. Now, if you want to call your father... I got off the phone book and called Pa at his printing plant on 14th Street, where he was a linotypist working out of the New York City Union. I got him on the phone and said, All I need is $100 bond for this $5,000 bail and can go home. Everything's okay. Well, everything's not okay with me. No Deleuze ever got involved in a murder. I told you that little mischievous devil would get you in trouble. I'm not going to lend you no $100 and you can go to hell, and I've got work to do. Goodbye bang the phone da grummet comes out again says how's the girl johnny every time i'm involved the police of new york seem to take more interest in my girlfriend me and the plain clothesman drive down to bellevue morgue in the gathering darkness and rain we park walk, walk out stop at the desk papers are shuffled and out comes a one-eyed lesbian woman in a big bleak apron who says okay ready for the elevator elevator depreciator i'd say we go down with her into a sinking smell of human refuse. You know what I mean. The smell of shit. Pure shit. Down, down, into the basement of Bellevue Morgue. Her one eye glaring at me, as John Holmes would say, banefully. God, I still hate that woman. She was like that character who charades you across the sticks into the hell regions of Greek mythology. She looked the part, and moreover was a woman, fat, sinister, the very wraparound for the devil's counterpart in a counterpane in Countertown's Beelzebur Fair, and worse. If she ever danced ring around the rosy with a maypole in, that, in some old Celtic or Austrian celebration, I'd as leaf bet that this here maypole weren't gonna last more than into May too. Yes, sir. We were disposed and displeased into the bottom of basements of Bellevue by her, and walked across a lot of file cabinets that you might think were handled by blue-eyed executive girls with Belgian builds. But no, it's this big Irishman with a sleeveless undershirt, munching on a sidewalk or sandwich or something, waltzes up from the rainy cellar doorway of the morgue where I see an ambulance opened at the back and some guys easing out a box with a body in it, and says, What is it? We've got to identify 169, says my cop. Right this way, says he, munching on his sandwich, comes to a number 169, and whips it open like I whip open my files in which all the old records are kept in mothballs. Only in this case, the old record is the actual body of poor Franz Mueller after he floated in the Hudson River some 50 hours, all bloated and blue but with red beard still there and his familiar sports shirt along his side and his sandals too. I swear he looks like a bearded old patriarch there, lying on his back with the beard jutted up, his unimaginable spiritual torment had turned him physically blue, and his dongs still preserved. Yeah, so apparently his dad um, did basically say, no Kerouac's ever been wrapped up in a murder, go to hell. Then a note comes in for me that I can call for a bail bond money. I ask for my Johnny's number and call her up in front and say, listen, my father is mad as hell. 
He won't lend me a hundred for the bond. The hell with him. Johnny, you borrow that money from your aunt. I'll get out of here. We'll get married. Right now, we'll go to Detroit and I'll get a job in a war plant and pay her off a hundred dollars or your father might lend it. But in any case, let's get married. My father having abandoned me, the first thing I thought of was getting married. And then I'll get a ship and ship out to Italy or France or someplace and send you my allowance. Okay, Jackie. But meanwhile, back in my cell trying to read, here comes the rest of them, a whole bunch, except the Chinese, who were Tong. Every one of them saying they were the only honest individual in the cell block and to tell them the gospel truth alone would save me. But the gospel truth was simply that Claude was a 19-year-old boy who had been subject to an attempt at degrading by an older man who was a pederast and that he had dispatched him off to an older lover called the River as a matter of record, to put it bluntly and truthfully, and that was that. That was why he was really a child of the rainbow. Even at 14, he could see through that guff, and the particular way it was laid down in this case, which was amounting to pursuit almost to the point of strong-arm threat or extortion. A man has a right to his own sexual life. Okay, demeaned by exhibitionism, ragged, hagged, witched at, not left in peace of own soul, right in the face of mankind's pleasuances, he just dumped the malicious childmongerer in the bloody drink and brook me that, rule me that, and duel me not that. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming that Jack Kerouac probably typed this all in one go, hence his little, like, kind of side notes in parentheses or whatever. Um, but yeah, um, it was often speculated that Lucian Carr might have been gay, especially by Allen Ginsberg, but um, him getting out of this murder situation without being jailed for life was uh, predicated on him being straight. <laughs> So if he was gay or bi, he would never have been able to be out about it or mention it to anyone. It is true that Jack Kerouac was able to get out of jail by being bailed out by E.B. Parker's parents, who were, of course, rich since she was from a socialite family. And um, he later annulled their marriage after he had descended into alcoholism. So this photo, which is kind of pixelated, is the one mentioned in Book 12, Chapter 7. Um, here's Lucian Carr and Jack Kerouac before they attempted to ship out posing at the Columbia Fountain, and this was taken by Jack's girlfriend, Edie Parker. And this photo is likely the one described in Book 12, Chapter 13. Um, it took a little bit of digging to find this one, uh, but anyway, there's Lucian looking pretty likely at the courthouse, and I would guess that the book he's holding there is Yates' A Vision.